Hi, I'm Steve Clasco, and I've had a hell of a morning. This morning I woke up in 2030. Now back in 2021, I was the president of Thomas Jefferson University and the CEO of Jefferson Health. Now, I'm the chief digital officer for the United States under President Taylor Swift. Yes, the Swifties became a real political party, and the president has just received word that there is a mutant strain of an RNA encapsulated virus that's been afflicting people in Australia. Of course, people old enough to remember, especially healthcare workers, the dark days of 2020 and 2021 and the COVID-19 crisis immediately panicked, but only for a second, and then they smiled because they knew that healthcare had evolved from a broken, fragmented, expensive, inequitable sick care system to a health assurance system where most of their care happens at home here in 2030. Since most of your healthcare data is now continuously streamed to the cloud and AI bots are constantly analyzing them for any changes, the early symptoms of this new virus were immediately identified and anyone throughout the world who exhibited those early symptoms was notified and asked to socially isolate. If needed, their employer was notified and asked for an excused absence. Software was immediately sent through the Internet of Things, what we now call the Internet of You, so your home 3D printer could begin to create masks for you and your family. Those who were having panic attacks, remembering the COVID-19 crisis of 2020 and 2021, could immediately communicate with their bot psychiatrist, and if necessary, could immediately receive drone-delivered treatment. There were no lines or concerns about food or supply storages for the same reason. Humans are not the dependent variable as the fourth industrial revolution, drones, AI, internet of things, and robotics, have modified the supply chain and there's no reason to congregate in crowded grocery stores or hoard toilet paper. The whole scare was over within a month as new bioprocessing techniques were able to identify, develop, and test vaccines through rapid prototyping. Oh, by the way, instruction for K-12 students continued seamlessly as the United States had finally reached broadband in 100% of households by 2025. And just as healthcare at home was mainstream, so were creative ways of teaching in a variety of venues. Okay, so, so now let's travel back to the present in 2021. I'm committed to working with you to make sure that that brief time travel is indeed a reality. A far cry from what we witnessed in my hometown of Philadelphia and throughout the country during the COVID crisis of 2020. While not enough can be said about the frontline healthcare heroes at Jefferson and throughout the country, data was scarce and not analyzed in a coordinated fashion. There were different strategies in different states, in some cases, different counties of the same state. Jefferson Health went, as I said, from 50 telehealth visits a day to over 4,000 a day. But many health systems did not have the bandwidth to accomplish telehealth. And speaking of bandwidth, most public schools shut down for months as cities such as Philadelphia had a large percentage of the population without broadband or computers at home. The war on the underserved, which is what historians called the reaction to the 2020 COVID crisis, forced a change in payment models so that every aspect of the healthcare ecosystem was compensated for keeping populations healthy. Food deserts were eliminated through drone delivery and enlightened social and educational food programs. Payers and providers aligned once doing better, not doing more, resulted in higher payments. It was not an easy road. The dirty, not so secret of healthcare in 2020 was that almost everybody made more money when more people were sick. It was hard to get big institutions excited about changing something when their revenue depended upon them not changing it. So the healthcare industry had failed to transform itself over many years. Consumers, business owners, and all rational people recognized how healthcare had escaped the consumer revolution as they watched hospitals fall and insurers have record profits during the COVID crisis. They watched the underserved and minority population dwindle 
because we had failed to address the social determinants and they recognized that things that they took for granted were difficult in healthcare. Even telehealth, believe it or not, in 2020 was viewed as a new technology. That failure of entrepreneurs and the traditional healthcare ecosystem to get together urgently to disrupt healthcare became incredibly visible throughout the COVID epidemic of 2020 to 2022. Throughout the crisis, no one worried about groups of people congregating at banks to get their deposits checked because everything they should have happened in healthcare had already happened in banking. The data was continuous, owned by the consumer, and almost all transactions could be done at home in 2020 in banking, unlike healthcare. With health assurance, we moved from the Internet of Things to the Internet of You. I remember back at Davos in 2020, the CEO of a banking conglomerate came up to me and said, you know, 20 years ago, the true groups that had totally escaped the consumer revolution were banking and healthcare. Now you're alone. Think about how the pandemic, even back in 2020, would have been handled differently if we had continuous data coming in from patients through their wearables and other sources as it related to temperature, respiratory rate, and other vital signs. Or if 3D printers were as ubiquitous as cell phones. Simply put, in many cases, our care back then, our cars back then got better care than we do. They were constantly sending data to the cloud. It's hard to believe, but only 10 years ago in 2020, people were going once a year for a static physical to an office as opposed to what we have become accustomed to, your t-shirt sending continuous data with AI filtering and human interaction when necessary. For example, the discrepancy between those healthcare systems that had a strategic alliance with a payer versus those that didn't came into sharp view during the COVID crisis. Healthcare providers were forced into canceling elective or non-essential surgeries and outpatient visits, the very services that brought in the dollars for the fee-for-service sick care world to subsidize the money losing chronic care management. Meanwhile, payers that already received their premiums had huge reserves and were paying out much less because these services were not being performed in order to conserve PPE. Since the system was not set up to be nimble, COVID pneumonias by and large were paid for as run of the mill pneumonias, despite the fact that the expenses for the provider for that care were often quintupled. Bottom line, providers were forced to put thousands of employees on furloughs or layoffs, insurers were able to decrease their medical loss ratios, and patients who lost their job often also lost their health insurance. For places like Kaiser and other integrated payer provider systems, they were to work out the economic maelstrom. Everyone else was left to react and fend for themselves and their employees. All in all, great progress is made in the delivery of health and the transformation would not have been as dramatic if not for the COVID crisis of 2020. In some respect, in a weird way, more lives were saved over the past 10 years because of the pandemic of 2020 to 2022 was a jolt and lightning rod for American healthcare to have an extreme makeover and for the sick system to finally get well. So how do we get from 2020 to 2030? Well, I wanna take you back I had an opportunity to work with Apple uh, in the pre-iPhone era. And John Scully, who had become the CEO of Apple to sort of get Steve Jobs to understand corporate America, had asked Steve to come up with a strategic and business plan like they had at Pepsi, which he ran. John's view of that was a very large, glossy brochure with spreadsheets, McKinsey, Accenture helping out. Steve's version was simply this. Here's my three-year business plan. Year one, we change. Year two, we change the industry. Year three, we change the world. So how do we change? Well, a book was written by one of my mentors, a guy named Bill Kissick at Wharton, who literally talked about the Iron Triangle of healthcare. The book was called Medicine's Dilemmas, Infinite Needs, Finite Resources. Sound familiar? And he said, there's an iron triangle of access, quality, and cost. If you increase access, you either have to increase cost or decrease quality, and you can go down the, the geometric line. He said, unless you're willing to disrupt the system, and disruption is painful. And literally for that whole early part of the decade of the 21st century, think about what our health policy was. The Affordable Care Act, President Obama said, this will increase access, increase quality, and decrease cost, and it won't be painful. That's impossible. President Trump said, 
my health care program will be terrific, fantastic, unbelievable, and huge, and it wasn't. But the simple fact is nobody wanted to do the disruptive things that would have really made the difference. This is healthcare's Amazon moment. If you're a provider and think you're gonna go back to your business model, solely being based on hospital revenue and not relevant to people who want care at home, I think you'll be out of business. If you're an insurer and you think you can just be the middleman between the hospital and the patient, you'll be irrelevant. If hospitals believe that innovation could just be this cute little thing that they do in the background, but the real business is just getting heads in beds, they're nuts. I think we were always wondering what the big disruption would be that got us to join the consumer revolution, and I really believe that this is it. So let's think about the Iron Triangle in a very different way, from the patient's point of view, because people don't view themselves as patients. They view themselves as people they want to be able to thrive without health getting in the way. They want to be able to connect and have human relationships with healthcare providers when they need it. They want to be able to easily navigate healthcare on their own terms like they can every other part of their life. And they also want to be able to understand what they do. And understanding is different than transparency. Transparency is CMS saying that I have to put my ChargeMaster 2800 page Excel spreadsheet on the internet. Transparency is, I need a hip replacement. I run half marathons. I want to know, based on your outcomes, what are the chances that I can do a half marathon in a year? Exactly what will it cost me? What rate of readmissions do you have and who will pay for it? What do patients say about you? And then I want to be able to go to other providers and get that information, just like I can in every other part of my life. That was the main thing that changed. At Jefferson, we made that decision in 2017 that we were gonna to go to a four pillar model. What Steve Jobs used to call the old math and new math. The old math was making computers and operating systems, which was the only math back then. The new math was the digital lifestyle. In our world, the old math is tuition, academics, and our 14 hospital system. The new math was innovation strategic partnerships. And right around 2020, the Innovation Strategic Partnerships pillar actually became our most successful pillar. So the question for us when I got a chance to take over Jefferson in 2013, can a 195-year-old academic medical center act like a startup company? And we made a few assumptions. We assumed that we would get paid based on quality, cost, patient experience, and outcomes. We assumed that our hospital stays would become commoditized. We assume that our doctors and nurses will not only have to uh, work with, but cooperate with deep learning entities. It took us about 50 years to get doctors and nurses to work together. Now we're gonna have to get doctors and robots to work together. We also recognize that if that's the case, then we need to select and educate our humans differently. And that population health, predictive analytics, and social determinants really need to move to the mainstream of clinical care, payment models, and medical education. When I started out in obstetrics, what would happen is a young woman would think that she might be pregnant. We'd do a pregnancy test, go to her family doctor, say, congratulations, Mrs. Jones. I'm going to send you to my obstetrician, Dr. Clasco. The chances that a 28-year-old person today will just take that advice for the most important thing in their life from a 64-year-old male primary care doctor are zero. So she'll say, well, that might be who you'd go to if you get pregnant, which you, you probably won't. I'm gonna talk to friends, I'm gonna look on the internet and decide who best matches what I need. So we decided actually to create that match.com between patients and providers, because finding the right doctor shouldn't be so hard. Same thing with remote monitoring. We're working with a company that literally can do most of pregnancy testing at home. Now think about this post-COVID, not just immediately, for years to come. The chances that a patient that needs three time a week non-stress tests will say, oh, let me get this straight. You want me to come into Philadelphia, pay $35 each time to park, go to a place where there's a lot of sick people, go up in an elevator, have somebody put a monitor on me that's been put on 10 other people so I can stare at the ceiling and have a nurse come in in two hours to tell me that the baby's normal. When I can do that at home, while I'm binge watching my favorite show with a glass of lemonade. 
That's really the difference that once people start to see those alternatives. And I really think Jack Ma at uh, Davos last year really put it best. No matter how artificial intelligence is good, human being in the future competed with the machine on knowledge, you don't have chance. Computer is always going to be smarter than you are. When there's a car, forget about it, who run faster. When there's a plane, don't think you can fly like a. When there's a computer, you know, computer is always smarter than you are. They never f forget. They remember everything. They never get angry. They calculate faster. Mm -hmm. But computer can never be as wise as a man. What's the difference between smart and wisdom? So how do we change the world in healthcare? So let me tell you what scares me about the digital acceleration caused by COVID-19. It's that we'll get it wrong. We have this unprecedented opportunity to shape this 30-year industrial cycle that will transform almost every sector of the world economy. We now know that digital technology will be ubiquitous. We'll stop calling it digital, just like we don't call it telebanking. But it's our responsibility to get this right, to create the restructuring of the next 100 years that will leave the world a better place. We now know that this new technology will be infused throughout the world economy. That means the pressure is on us to make sure it's done responsibly. In some respects, that's why Heyman and I started talking about on healthcare. We're convinced that truly putting the person in the center, whether that person is a patient or not, can integrate healthcare, make it consumer friendly, but also solve the health disparities that help create 20 year life expectancy gaps between zip codes in America. But only if we design the unhealthcare system with those disparities and with that ethics in mind. So what happens if robots and humans actually start to work together to provide better health? I wrote an article for Modern Healthcare after my time at the World Economic Forum, and we're actually working in that stakeholder capitalism world about recognizing that the two crises that really do not have any borders are both climate change and healthcare inequities. So here's what happens once you go from sick care to health insurance. I, I mentioned the pregnancy model of the difference between having to come into the hospital three times a week to get your baby monitored versus being able to do it at work or home. So what does that have to do with disparities? Well, the simple fact is that we are somewhere around number 45 of 100 developed countries in maternal mortality and neonatal morbidity. Now think about that, why is that? With all the resources we have, we're by far the most expensive. It's because of that, uh, that gap. And just think back to the testing model. If you're, if you're a wealthy person, no problem coming into the hospital three times a week, paying for parking, taking the time off. If you're in a very different situation where you can't take that time off, or you can't afford childcare, or you don't have money for gas in your car, what you do is you just don't get the testing. Once we democratize that testing though, by being able to do it at home, literally we're able to make significant changes in, in maternal outcomes. There is no reason, no reason, that in a place like Philadelphia with six academic medical centers, there should be a 21 year disparity between going six miles on either side of the Rocky statue. So one of the things that came out of our Davos discussions were that we need large scale transformations in healthcare to both survive as a business and to have a positive societal outcome. And again, I believe that COVID will be a nidus for that. The fourth industrial revolution will give us the tools and data to do this, but we need to proactively address the human and ethical consequences up front. And healthcare and academic success two areas that really need to go through disruption, will require changes in our way of thinking, creative partnerships to create new ecosystems. And by the way, there is no such thing as non-disruptive disruption. It will be painful for those who don't want to think differently as these new ecosystems are built. That's been true in every area that's been transformed. Think Sears and Pennies. Think travel agents that didn't get the importance of e-travel. Oh, and what about food deserts? Well, think about this. In 2020, the reason there were food deserts was because certain zip codes, those one with long life expectancies, 
might be able to walk to two or three Whole Foods or Trader Joe's. The ones with much less life expectancies could only walk to a bodega that sold corn chips and sodas. And they might not have been able to afford, afford the gas. The combination of enlightened health policy and drone delivery of food changed all that. The enlightened health policy was that if you're willing to give your, your family healthy meals, we'll give you 50% more electronic food transfers if you're on food assistance. And by the way, we'll drone deliver to you. Literally eliminating food as deserts. Just one of the examples where smart policy, AI, and a human component made a difference. Oh, and the final mandate for AI, we finally started to learn from our mistakes. Fun, sexy, safe. Just like that guy, we keep making the same mistake over and over again. So we started to look at simulation in a whole different way, transplanting medical advices, advances in knowledge into improved patient care through procedure rehearsal studios. I'm a private pilot, and every two years I have to get my technical competence assessed. As a surgeon, nobody's assessed my objectively my technical competence in 30 years. In fact, we talk about the way training is. If you ask any surgeon, how did you learn this procedure? See one, do one, teach one. That makes zero sense in 2020. And over the decade from 2020 to 2030, that went away. Just to give you an example, I learned how to intubate a one and a half pound baby in the middle of a chaotic delivery room. Now, nobody does that until they've proven that they can do it on one of these simulated little one and a half pound uh, robot babies, knowing that they can do it safely before they get to a human. Jason Kidd got traded to the Dallas Mavericks, uh, and the team had been 24 and 52. And at his press conference, this is what he said. We're going to turn this team around 360 degrees. We do a lot of turning things around 360 degrees and ending up in the same place in healthcare. And that's what really had to change starting in 2020. And most importantly, if there's one thing that this crisis has shown us is that we have to, have to, have to start now. Thank you very much. So let me give you a few surprises uh, and really cut the suspense. You did start in 2020. You did make those changes. You did go from sick care to health assurance. And that's why things are so good in 2030. Oh, and by the way, one other surprise. I'm not really me. I'm a hologram of me coming back to let you know that you're just about to start a renaissance in healthcare.